And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, I'm your host, Robert Picto. Registered in 1967, the townhouse complex of Brentwood Village in Edmonton, Alberta, was the first condominium development in Canada. With regular condominiums, the unit owner usually owns the internal unit space and a share of the corporation. The corporation owns the exterior of the building, land, and common area. On today's Open Connection, we open our archives to bring you this story from 1989. This vacant piece of land near downtown Terrace doesn't look like much right now, but if all goes as planned, it will soon undergo a dramatic transformation. Plans are in the works to develop a condominium-style housing complex catering to the needs of seniors. Such projects have been highly successful in the Lower Mainland, and now a group of local seniors hopes to have a similar condo-style complex ready for occupancy by November. The Skeena Senior Citizens Housing Society has been meeting with people aged 55 and up in an effort to find potential buyers. And so far, the level of interest has been high enough to get the project off the ground. The man responsible for bringing the idea to Northwest Seniors knows what he's talking about. Tony Pauls and his wife lived in similar housing in the Fraser Valley, and when they moved north two years ago, Pauls planted the seed that brought the Twin River Estates plan to life. I think it's just an ideal setup for retired people that want to get away from the, all the heavy chores of their own home. And it's much like your own home. And it's not like an apartment because you have a front patio door and you have a back patio door. You have a lawn at the back and a patio in front. And, well, I, I just can't praise it enough. And I have had the experience, so I know. Once Pauls had convinced his contemporaries of the merits of such a housing development, the Skeena Senior Citizens Housing Society was formed. The seniors found themselves a builder, and the project became a very real goal. Dennis Palmu says it's a development that crosses both political and age barriers, and he's pleased with the support generated so far. And uh, we've had widespread uh, support from uh, all age groups and uh, all political parties as well that have said if there's anything that we can do to help or we're behind you and uh, we, we like what you're doing and uh, we, we wish you every success. So it's been very encouraging that way. The initial phase of the three-phase project involves the construction of 32 units. The standard unit will be 930 square feet and sell for $50,500. And the deluxe unit will cover 1,170 square feet and cost $10,000 more. However, the first-time buyers will actually get $2,000 of their initial investment back. In order to acquire the land um, and not have to build uh, the whole uh, 80 unit complex in, in one phase. What we've done is um, um, increased the cost to the first time buyers and uh, at the same time guaranteeing them uh, the lowest uh, purchase price. And uh, so what we've done is made a uh, uh, $2,000 um, amount uh, part of the purchase price of the first 32 units and that uh, $2,000 amount over and above the actual purchase price will be returned to them with interest as soon as the second phase goes ahead. With sales of the units now past the halfway point, the Twin uh, Rivers site has been purchased and construction should control. begin by May. And, uh, so we're pleased to have been able to purchase the land now and there, the next two uh, major steps are to apply for the rezoning of the property from commercial to high density residential and uh, secondly, to uh, finalize the working drawings for the project. Palmu says one of the biggest selling features is the development site itself. With 20 units sold so far, he hopes to have all 32 sold by the start of construction. And that shouldn't be a problem if there are more seniors who are as enthusiastic as Connie Porter. She's one of the initial 20 buyers and is looking forward to the day she can move into her new home. Well, firstly, 
There's no grounds maintenance. Secondly, no snow removal. Those are the main reasons we're moving in for it. Would there be some things maybe that you would miss about your house? Well, probably the size because the units are not as big as the house we are living in. But then again, I don't have that much housework to do. <laughs> If anything is attractive to the seniors involved in this project, it is that it's affordable. Nevertheless, Palmy recognizes that many seniors will have difficulty managing even $50,000. In order to keep the price down, the Senior Society has gone with a co-op housing concept. And what that means is that the society actually owns the land and the buildings. Uh, technically, um, the uh, occupant um, loans the society uh, the money in order for the right to occupy that unit for as long as they want to. And then when they move out, um, the money, uh, the full purchase price is refunded to them. And then the society that way has control over who is moving in. And uh, they also have control over the uh, resale price, if you will, of the unit. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. Aging in place means staying at your own home and community as you get older. Many seniors choose to downsize, find a home with few stairs, or live close to shops and transportation services. Let us return to the archives to hear other reasons why seniors choose to downsize. I've always promoted the fact that a lot of older people cannot afford more than about 50000 and, and they're lucky if they've got that, they'll have to sell their home to get in. But I wouldn't want to keep that price down. As far as Connie Porter is concerned, the cost of buying and maintaining one of these units is a pretty good deal. Oh, definitely. I, it is one of the best I have seen because I know I have figured up what it costs us to run our house and it's the cost of, of these units, once you <clears throat> have put your money down, is even less than, than what it would cost to run my own house. And for seniors with a case of wanderlust, and, uh, there are other features which Paul's believes add even more incentive. If you want to go away, now for instance, we have one family down in California, in Sacramento, and one daughter, married daughter. There's the security of it. You, you can leave and you don't have to worry because you've got in this cluster of four, four units within one cluster, you've got three neighbors without going outdoors. And you just lock your door and you can go. Despite all the obvious advantages to seniors interested in the condo concept housing, it did take a while to gain their confidence since the idea is still fairly new to many in the Northwest. At first, people were very leery of what they're getting into. Of course, people want to know what they're getting into. Now they're beginning to understand what they're getting into, so this thing is starting to snowball. And also there's the fact that they can pay their money for the use of this, but if they decide to move out or uh, they pass on, that money that they have paid in will be paid back either to them or their estate. One of the uh, major hurdles has just been uh, say skepticism or uh, questions that people have had on the type of housing that we're going to be putting up. Uh, there's been a number of uh, housing developments that have been done over the years in Terrace, uh, some which are better than others, uh, some which are or leave something to be desired as far as the, uh, the layout and as far as the, uh, the quality of the construction. So we've had to ensure people by uh, showing them our plans and specifications that uh, it is a quality project. Tony Paul says the only negative comments he's heard have come from those with a green thumb. There's the odd one that says, oh, I don't want to leave my garden. But we've got a, we've got a lovely site where there's going to be room for garden, not a large garden, but everybody can have their garden if they want the garden. That's about the only negative I've heard on, on the project. And we've assured them that they can have their garden. As far as I'm concerned, it's all positive. Since there are no housing projects like this one in northern BC, Palmu hopes to set a trend. Often seniors are drawn away from the north by the amenities in other communities, and he sees the Twin River Estates as a way to keep seniors from having to leave this region. 
one of the ways that we can encourage our seniors to stay in Terrace and in northern communities is to have um, affordable housing and, and, and decent housing for them uh, where they don't have to worry about cutting lawns and, and shoveling snow and all the rest of it and where they have a community of, uh, of seniors that they can associate with as well. A lot of them would rather stay here but there's no place for them to go when they can't look after their own place so they go south and they shouldn't have to go south they should stay right here because this climate isn't that bad and uh, you, you, many of them have their families here, so why not? I think it's a growing thing. Although the new housing is designed with the independent senior in mind, there's also room for the under 65 set. In fact, in Abbotsford, Matsqui, where we're from, we have quite a number of people just over the, over the 50 limit, or close to 55, still working. They go to work every day, mm -hmm. but they wanted to secure the unit so that when they retire, they've got right. it. The project has the support of Terrace City Council, and the Seniors Housing Society is hoping to have the local buses rerouted to pass right by the development. Completion of the entire project will take from three to five years and will cost about $4 million. But in the meantime, phase one is scheduled for occupancy by next November, and Palmu says with only 12 units left in the initial phase, interested parties don't have much time to get on the affordable housing bandwagon at Twin River Estates. In the meantime, those who have bought into the condo-style housing project are concentrating on getting the development off the drawing board and into the construction phase. Oh, definitely. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. It was recorded that in September of 1927, the idea of forming the Omnica Ski Club first occurred at an impromptu gathering of timber cruisers and trappers, a decidedly cosmopolitan party with a slight Scandinavian majority, as they settled in for an evening at the cozy sitting room of the Omnivica Hotel. Let us return to archives to bring you this story from 1989. Burns Lake is a small and, by some standards, remote community. But for one week in March, this small town enjoyed a well-deserved ego boost. Burns Lake and the Omanika Ski Club hosted the 1989 Canadian National Seniors Cross Country Ski Championships. Canada's best skiers gathered here for competition. At the stadium area at the ski trails a few miles south of Burns Lake, it was obvious something important was underway. Doug Campbell is president of the Omanika Ski Club. He says the whole town pitched in to make the Nationals a success. Our support from the local community is absolutely tremendous. Businesses, individuals, community organizations, members of has absolutely chipped in any way they've been able to. Um, we've gone out, we've asked different businesses for door prizes, nobody's turn, turned us down. People to come out and work parties, everybody comes out and works. Just tremendous. What sort of work was done to get the area ready? What did it look like before? I mean, I'm assuming all the orange fencing is new. What things were changed? We built a new lodge up uh, at the back side, and we built a new timing cabin. Um, we enlarged, or it, I shouldn't say enlarged, but we changed our trail system somewhat to make one section of it more difficult for the caliber of skiers we're getting. Um, we enlarged our whole stadium area so that we have lots of room for these mass starts. The budget for upgrading the ski area, including the lodge and timing cabin and trail improvements, was $130,000. One third of that came in the form of a provincial lottery grant, the rest in donated materials and labor, something that seems possible only in a small community. Participants in the competition were impressed by the quality of sight for the races. Marty Hall is the national team coach. Well, from the uh, point of view of the organization of the race, perfect. It's, uh, tracks are excellent, course uh, demanding, snow conditions couldn't be better, super day. This is what we want, uh, come home and have nice weather. We've been in Europe for over six weeks and all we had was just nicky, rainy, cloudy, no sun weather and uh, this is fun to come and race like this and the enthusiasm is excellent, uh, fantastic. You can't ask for anything better. I mean, they've got two lighted tracks in this uh, town. Uh, uh, the terrain is excellent. The support is excellent. Uh, 
There's no reason, you know, Chris Polson is here, uh, Esther Miller's come out of this town. Uh, no reason why we shouldn't see more and more skiers come out of, uh, out of Burns Lake. Uh, most of our skiers come out of small towns anyway. And it seems like uh, the programs, uh, there's four or five hundred members in this club and the enthusiasm is uh, high and excellent and uh, uh, there's no reason for people not to want to ski and uh, to excel. Uh, we look for, you know, all kinds of support and athletes to come out of here in the future. The support for the small town ski clubs is echoed by Pierre Garter, the BC representative in the national team organization and former chairman of Cross Country Canada. Well, I was up here uh, 10 years ago, I think the first time, and uh, coming in here uh, yeah, last night, I poked around and, uh, and this morning, and there's no doubt that, that those of us who have, see, have seen a lot of high-class facilities are very, very impressed. And it's very nice to see that a small community, they can go so far in such a short span of time. As someone with representation provincially and nationally, why do you think that a club like this is able to turn out um, national caliber skiers like the Chris Paulsons? Well, uh, it's a very interesting question, but uh, this thing with producing athletes is also always a numbers game. And uh, in every little community there are potential material. And the moment you get the whole community like Burns Lake behind a ski club, you get coaches, officials, and you start to, it starts to build. Uh, they have a, a strong jackrabbit program here, as you know, which is small kids. And traditionally, there has been uh, good racers here coming out of Burns Lake for many years. And I think it's the enthusiasm that started way back then. And some of the old timers that were involved 15 years ago helping kids are still uh, out there helping uh, the younger generation. So I think it's a, it, it is the closeness of a small community. Uh, and I really believe in that. We have, we see it all over. In certainly British Columbia, we have a number of small communities where, which are actually producing our top athletes. They're not coming from Vancouver. I hope they will soon. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Born in Calgary, Alberta, Tony Dufferin is a seasoned climber, hiker, and ski mountaineer with close to 50 years of experiences on various mountain ranges. In this final segment of Open Connection, Tony shares his thoughts about the event. Tony Daffern was the technical delegate. He represents Cross Country Canada at the race, ensuring the rules are adhered to and to provide technical advice to the race organizers. Yes, I came here in late September last year and uh, met with all the organizers, went over all the details of the event with them. Uh, we walked the courses and had a look at the courses that we were going to use and made some of the basic decisions on which courses we were going to use for which race you know, right then so that they could get on with their preparations. Then once you arrive, when race time comes around, what sorts of things are you doing closer to the event? Well, the first thing I do when I came on site on uh, Tuesday morning was to ski the courses, have a look at the snow conditions. Uh, I looked over the start-finish area and they explained to me exactly how they were going to set everything up and how they were going to get the athletes into the start line and how we were going to organize the mass start and how many lanes we were going to put in and all that kind of thing. So there's some real solid thinking to be done before the race is actually, and the grounds are set up. I mean, this isn't here all the time. This was established for the purposes of this event. That's correct. These things are all pre-planned, and the more planning you can do in, advan in advance of the event, the better the event will run, and this one has certainly run very smoothly today. The final proof is in the race itself, from the mass starts to the finish line. Quebec's Yves Bilodeau was the number one skier at this competition and is one of Canada's best. After the men's 30-kilometer classic, he commented on the course. Pretty good one. It's a tough course, I think. It's uh, good for when you're in good shape. Also part of the support team from Cross Country Canada is the event development coordinator, Paul Grainer. We uh, support all the events in the country. We have a Vashon K-1 
Canada Cup circuit that started in Labrador, Newfoundland, and will finish in Hollyburn Ridge in Vancouver. It's a number of races uh, meant for development for athletes, officials, and the areas. I also look after the national uh, events such as the seniors, which are being held right here in Burns Lake, and also the ski odyssey events. So we try and give as much service as we can within the local ski clubs and help them make um, uh, a very superior event. So when you come to some place like the Amanika Ski Club, what sort of, I guess, day-to-day -day things were you faced with when you arrived? Uh, we look after the site service, laying out the stadium area, liaisoning with the media, making sure their time is working, setting up a sound system, helping with uh, banneries, um, uh, looking after the draw, the coaches' accommodations, just whatever happens to... Um, uh, whatever is sort of the necessary thing to do. What's exciting here is they have a, uh, a really neat renovator that they've bored or from an outfit in the U.S. that they have up here um, uh, and they're able to use to improve their course, which has really helped. So to see exciting things like that, that the club has gone out into the industry itself and and with the help of things like major sponsors such as Houston Force Products and Bean, certainly the event would not be as spectacular as it's been so far. And of course, one of the highlights for members of the Almanica Ski Club was to cheer on their local racers. Chris Paulson plays 10th in the 30 kilometer classic, 9th in the 15K classic, 8th in the 50 kilometer free technique, and 5th in the relay, along with BC teammates Lewis Helbig and Darren DeRoche. Paulson of Decker Lake says it was good to ski at his home club. Oh, it's really good. It's, you know, a big crowd out, and lots of support, and it feels good. Paulson, 22 years old, skis as a senior, but he's got a background of medals as a competitor in the Canadian Junior Championships, and more recently was named to the National B Team, representing his country earlier this year in Europe. Needless to say, he's pleased with his success. Yes, it's went really well in my best years so far, and hopefully I can pick up a few places in the next few races at these championships. What was the highlight of this past season? Uh, probably a relay. I uh, finished in Switzerland. I went out and I was uh, came in first on the first leg, so it was, felt really good to ski over there. So ski fast. What do you see coming up in the future? What are you looking forward to? Well, hopefully I can uh, make the Team 92 the national team for next year and ski with them. The second rising star of the Almanica Ski Club is 19-year-old Tony Strimbled. Earlier this ski season, Strimbled was the best junior at the Vachon Cup in Alberta and the fourth junior at the World Championship Trials in Ontario. At this seniors event, Tony was 17th in the 30-kilometer classic and 23rd in the 15-kilometer. Strimbled, like Paulson, is looking forward to next year and his skiing future. I'd like to be around the top 12 overall next year. But, uh, it'll be tough because uh, everyone's starting to ski a lot faster nowadays. One thing to note at this national race is there were spectators, something that has not always been true for cross-country skiing. Pierre Garter says cross-country is getting more glamorous. Well, I, I think my favorite phrase when we talk about this is to say that we, we are moving quite away from the granola bar and Nikish uh, style type. Uh, we get into flashy clothes and, and a lot of things that appeal, you know. People don't like it when I say it has sex appeal, but it does. cross country skiing is starting to have some of that appeal and, and a lot of, of youngsters uh, uh, we get some of the ones that would end up in the downhill slopes going with us. And don't forget that last year we sold more cross-country skis than downhill skis in British Columbia. So it is going in the right direction. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictow.